heavy tidings, for which I call upon the house and the nation. There's no doubt that 1941 was a crucial year, full of developments in World War II for Adolf Hitler and all those who opposed him. With France now controlled by the Germans, Britain had been left to fight on alone, taking the full brunt of the Nazi attack. Despite all expectations, however, they had been able to weather the storm, and by April, Germany had changed tactics, resorting to the bombing of British seaports rather than targeting the nation's towns and cities in an effort to dominate at sea after losing the Battle of Britain back in 1940. In the Mediterranean, Germany was dealt a bitter blow by the Allies at the Battle of Matapan, but with Hitler's great favourite, General Erwin Rommel, beginning his march into Allied-held territory in North Africa, the global conflict was spreading. Italian forces under Mussolini had also been drawn into the North African campaign, hindering the British in Somaliland and Ethiopia. For Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who had already proved himself to be a worthy opponent for Adolf Hitler, securing support from America was vital, and although President Roosevelt had done all that he could, the people of the USA were still staunchly against entering the war to fight for the Allies. Even so, Adolf Hitler knew that he had a huge battle on his hands with Churchill on the other side of the English Channel. But as if that wasn't enough, the German Führer was ready to look east towards Russia, the nation he had signed the non-aggression pact with before storming into Poland in 1939. Would Hitler dare go back on his word and attack the Soviet Union before completing his plans to invade Great Britain? The events of April, May and June 1941 about to answer this question and many more besides. As April 1st dawned, there was a difficult time ahead for the Allies in North Africa. Rommel, who would become better known as the Desert Fox because of his cunning desert strategies, was already beginning his ruthless assault on the Allied-held lines. The German Africa Corps swiftly gained the upper hand. The British troops, given the task of defending the territory, went into retreat. Rommel was pleasantly surprised at the ease with which this happened and moved his troops towards Benghazi and on April the 3rd took Libya's second city. Encouraged, Rommel soon set his sights on Tobruk as a prelude to making a German advance into Egypt. North Africa and the Middle East were hotbeds of activity during this phase of World War II, as all sides in the conflict fought to maintain access to oil supplies, with Axis supporters in countries like Iraq giving the Allies a real challenge. And while the Nazi cause was being furthered, their fellow Germans were making major advances in Europe. By April 6th, Forces were employing their incredibly successful blitzkrieg tactics wherever they went, 
and the Allied troops stationed in Greece were quickly defeated. Again, the Allies were forced into retreat and Hitler's domination was increasing daily. The first weeks of April 1941 were, from the point of view of military strategy, absolutely fascinating. As Hitler accelerated his plans to invade Russia, it was Winston Churchill who directed Sir Stafford Cripps, the British ambassador in Moscow, to deliver a message to Joseph Stalin warning of a possible German attack. We've got to try and help the Russians in every way that we can to make ready to meet the spring offensive of Hitler. Just a few weeks later, Churchill warned Stalin in person of Hitler's plans based on ultra-intelligence reports. But by this stage, the Russian leader was already preparing, drafting in extra troops to defend the nation's borders while bringing in reinforcements to protect Moscow. And while Churchill and Stalin were fully occupied, Hitler had quickly made a pact with the Japanese, promising that if they found themselves in conflict with the USA, something that was looking increasingly likely, then Germany would join them in declaring war on America. The Soviets signed a similar treaty with Yugoslavia in case of a German attack, while to complicate matters even further, Japan and the Soviet Union signed a five-year non-aggression pact. With so much tactical maneuvering going on and switching of allegiances, it was difficult for anyone to predict what was going to happen next. But for those being targeted by Adolf Hitler, the most imminent threat was all they had time to worry about. In Northern Ireland, Belfast suffered a brutal German attack, with the Luftwaffe raining down terror from the skies. Ironically, Belfast was hit by one of the most devastating air raids of the war on Easter Sunday, April 15th, on what should have been a day of peace and celebration. More than 200 German aircraft strafed the city, and through a combination of standard explosive and incendiary bombs, claimed the lives of 900 people and injured more than 1,500 others. For the Germans, casualties were light with no anti-aircraft guns fired because RAF fighters were believed to be in the area, although they had never actually been scrambled. And all the while, in Africa, Rommel was still making rapid progress, but despite his gains, he drew his troops to a halt at the fort of Tobruk, which was destined to become a battleground for many a military engagement in the months ahead. Between April 13th and 15th, it appeared that the Nazis were on course for another easy victory, as his tanks quickly advanced into the city. But his tanks became trapped as the Allies made the most of the situation, marking the beginning of a siege, the outcome of which was never going to be a foregone conclusion. The Germans were also very active just across the Mediterranean, as Hitler made plans to attack the island of Crete, which would be codenamed Operation Mercury. This would consolidate his position, having already attacked the Greek mainland, and deny the British a convenient base on the island, as by April 24th, Greece had fully surrendered to the Nazis, and Hitler's decision to target Crete was a logical next step. Still, the political maneuvering continued. Roosevelt proposed transferring part of the US fleet to the Atlantic Ocean, and Winston Churchill was happy to support the move. Although the Americans were yet to join the Allies fully in the war effort, their contribution, supporting from the sidelines, was invaluable. It was now almost impossible for the Allies to predict Hitler's next move. And naturally, for Winston Churchill, there were still grave concerns 
that a full-scale Nazi invasion of Great Britain was on the way. In fact, there were those who suggested that British troops should abandon the fight in the Middle East and return to protect their homeland. But Churchill was opposed to the idea, and he must have been heartened by news that in East Africa the Italians had surrendered, which allowed Haile Selassie to return to Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, and reclaim his throne. The tide was slowly but surely turning in many different directions, and as May 1941 progressed, there were some astonishing surprises in store. One of the most incredible of them all came on May 10th, when Hitler's second-in-command, Rudolf Hess, was discovered with a broken ankle in a Scottish field. Interestingly, despite his long and loyal devotion to Hitler, Hess had often been overlooked as praise was lavished upon his more vociferous rivals for the Führer's attention, Hermann Goering and Joseph Goebbels. Although there are all manner of conspiracy theories, it's generally believed that dissatisfaction with Hitler's leadership caused Hess to undertake a solo mission, flying to Britain to broker a peaceful conclusion to the hostilities with Winston Churchill. By this time, there was a growing German resistance, already working towards assassinating Adolf Hitler, so Hess would have by no means been alone in feeling that the Führer's days were numbered. When news reached Hitler that Hess's plane had taken off, fighter pilots were dispatched to prevent him reaching his destination. Hess managed to reach Scotland before he had to bail out, which is how he came to break his ankle. For Hess, the war was over. After being kept prisoner by the British until the Nuremberg trials, and he was eventually sent to Berlin Spandau prison, where he remained until his death in 1987. But for the Luftwaffe, May 10th proved to be very busy indeed because after Hess made his emergency landing in Scotland, a total of 515 bombers attacked London, scoring direct hits on several of the city's great landmarks, including the British Museum, the Houses of Parliament and St James's Palace. The number of casualties grew to staggering proportions, making this the highest death toll for a single raid throughout the war, claiming 1,364 lives, while over 1,600 were left injured. One of the reasons for the large number of casualties was the lack of bomb shelters for much of the city's population. Public air raid shelters were available, although the government was reluctant to provide too many, in case people became too dependent upon government aid. Consequently, families were encouraged, with the provision of subsidised materials, to build their own shelters, leaving those who were unable to make their own arrangements to use the London underground stations as a haven during the raids. Although the losses suffered by the people of London that fateful night were without doubt devastating, there was some consolation. Britain's aerial defences had improved greatly, and the Germans were certainly not going to be able to continue inflicting such damage without paying a price. At this point in the conflict, the average Nazi fighter plane casualties per raid had increased from just 28 in January of 1941 to 128 by mid-May. Despite this, there was large improvements in technology, both on the ground and in the air for the British. Radar allowed ground crews to be ready well before the raids began, 
and with airborne radar fitted to some British aircraft, RAF pilots were able to successfully engage the enemy, especially at night when visibility was severely reduced. Unlike Belfast, London also had a large contingent of anti-aircraft batteries, which allowed for a steady rate of fire against the Luftwaffe, and this certainly made a huge contribution to reducing the German Air Force's effectiveness. Hitler's aerial attacks against his enemies, using a blanket of firebombs to cripple industry and destroy housing as he broke the spirit of the people, had brought him great success. But Londoners were made of sterner stuff. Sadly, in Belfast, the bombing of a major waterworks had meant that the pressure wasn't high enough to fight the fires. But London suffered no such difficulty, and crews worked tirelessly to prevent the fires from spreading. As many of those from the emergency services were now fighting for their country, volunteers took their places. Members of the Home Guard really played a crucial part in stopping London from burning. And there was a great deal of work to be done. So, as well as firefighters and first aiders, these brave volunteers also took on tasks like running for the Blitz Scouts, who were responsible for guiding fire engines and ambulances through the worst of the flames and the rubble to get to the injured. After this raid on London, a further wave of Luftwaffe bombers hit Birmingham just six days later, and thankfully did much less damage. Throughout the Blitz, British cities and their people had suffered some of the most destructive attacks of any conflict to date. However, they were not the only nation to be attacked in this manner during World War II. And as the war shifted more in the Allies' favour, British and American bombers would target German cities with equally appalling consequences. Aerial bombardment was one of the more devastating acts of war used throughout the conflict between the Allies and the Axis powers. While the tactical bombing of troops had been the main aim of air forces before the Second World War, these more strategic terror raids were fast becoming the order of the day. Focusing on destroying industry and crippling the economy of a country was a major consideration, while terrifying civilians and breaking their spirit was another major aim. For the British, keeping morale high, whatever the German bombers threw their way, was of vital importance, and Winston Churchill was without doubt a master at lifting the mood of the nation. Wherever he went, visiting bombed-out cities, the people came out to cheer him, and Churchill was able to make even those who had lost everything feel that their sacrifices had not been in vain. Taking a closer look at what happened in Plymouth demonstrates just how deadly and effective Hitler's air raid tactics were. During the relentless raids on the city, even air raid shelters were no guarantee of safety, and when a communal shelter took a direct hit, 72 people were killed as entire families were wiped out. Not surprisingly, by the beginning of May, plans were put in place to evacuate the city's children, and they were sent off to the relative safety of North Cornwall on May the 3rd, the day after Churchill's visit. The good folk of Plymouth had borne the fearsome brunt of a sustained Luftwaffe attack, but like the rest of the great British public, they refused to be intimidated. When a local headmistress nailed a wooden sign over the door of a badly damaged church, simply saying 
resurgum. She summed up the mood of Plymouth, with the Latin word translating literally as, I shall rise again. And as Churchill made his way through the rubble of Plymouth, his resolve to stand firm against Hitler must have been strengthened as he encouraged the survivors, assuring them that Plymouth, like the entire nation, would indeed rise again. But with British cities like London, Belfast and Plymouth to mention but a few, suffering such heavy bombardments, a counter-attack against the Germans was inevitable. Throughout April and early May, Hamburg and Berlin were both hit repeatedly by RAF bombers, although they could not inflict the kind of damage the Luftwaffe had on British cities. Nevertheless, just as Hitler had tried to break the British spirit through the Blitz, the RAF certainly dented German morale, even though the bombing raids did relatively little damage. From the British perspective, when the Chief of Air Staff, Sir Charles Portal, declared that if you could get four million people out of their beds and into shelters, it was worth it, he summed up the aim of the mission, considering the limited resources available to the RAF at that time. Being able to bomb cities as far away as Berlin was, in point of fact, a new concept for the RAF, because up until this point in history, their planes simply didn't have that kind of range without needing to refuel. However, thanks to the development of longer-range bombers, it had become a possibility since the beginning of 1940, although without a doubt these raids took the RAF to the limit of their technology. Consequently, these attacks on German cities had to be conducted during the summer months when the hours of light were longer, but this did make the Allied aircraft far more likely to be spotted by enemy defences. It would actually be 1942 before the RAF would have the resources to effectively bomb German cities, and longer again before they implemented them fully. Meanwhile, back in North Africa, the siege of Tobruk was continuing, but the chief of British Middle East Command, General Archibald Wavell, saw an unexpected window of opportunity. With so many Axis troops engaged in the siege, there was a weak defensive front between Egypt and Libya, and quick to take the initiative, Wavell instigated Operation Brevity on May the 15th. The main objective would be to acquire this territory, pushing Rommel and the Germans back from the Egyptian-Libyan border and then launch an offensive on Tobruk. The first part of the offensive involved taking the Italian-controlled Halfaya Pass, which was an important strategic location for both Allied and Axis forces. On the morning of the 15th, despite stiff Italian opposition, the Allies took the strategically vital pass and, throwing Axis commanders into a state of confusion, gained the upper hand. However, as the Allies made progress, the Germans were swift in pouring reinforcements into the battle zone without losing their stranglehold on Tobruk. The engagements were hard fought in difficult conditions, and the Allied casualty numbers started to rise dramatically. With Rommel having been so successful in the preceding months, Allied reinforcements would be very hard to come by, and rather than sustain further losses, Operation Brevity was closed down. Retreating to the Halfire Pass, the Allies did all they could to hold this strategic position, but for Rommel, Operation Brevity had actually alerted him to how important this pass was, 
gave whoever held it a safe supply route through the region, and the Allies were not able to hold it for long as the Germans launched Operation Scorpion to take it back on May 27th, in effect reversing all the territorial gains that had been made as a result of Operation Brevity. While conquering Africa had always been a very large part of the Nazi master plan, Hitler had always known that neutralizing the threat posed by the British Navy was of equal importance. The main purpose of the Battle of Britain back in 1940 had been to destroy the RAF fighter planes to prevent them coming to the aid of British battleships when Germany was ready for a full-scale invasion. In fact, Hitler had started building warships to match those of the British Navy back in the early 1930s. And when the pride of the German Navy, the Bismarck, was dispatched on May 19, 1941, it was the ship's first operational sortie. The Bismarck's mission had been to intercept and destroy Allied convoys in transit between North America and Great Britain. With the German U-boats presence as well, Allied shipping ran terrible risks, particularly as British intelligence were unable to track the positions of the enemy. However, on May 9th there was a glimmer of hope, because when Allied forces boarded a captured German U-boat, they were able to recover an Enigma cipher machine and the German code books. Once in the hands of British intelligence, with the code breakers at Bletchley Park in the heart of the English countryside, the Allies' prospects out in the Atlantic improved dramatically, as coded German radio transmissions were deciphered giving British and American ships some warning of where the enemy lay in wait for them. As the Bismarck, along with the Prinz Jugend, a German heavy cruiser, attempted to break out into the Atlantic, they were spotted by the British Royal Navy and the Battle of Denmark Strait began. The major casualty of the engagement was the flagship of the British home fleet, HMS Hood, and when news reached Churchill in London, he angrily demanded that the German ship responsible, the Bismarck, be hunted down and sunk. Two days later, as the Bismarck headed for safety, aircraft from HMS Ark Royal attacked the enemy ship, the damaged craft became an easy target. On May 27th, she was finally sunk, and at last the people of Britain, still reeling from the effects of the Blitz, had something to celebrate. The capture of the German Enigma machine and the subsequent breaking of the latest enemy codes certainly proved to be of great benefit to Allied shipping, but the implications were actually far more widespread. When Adolf Hitler's plans for Operation Mercury, the invasion of Crete, were put into action, because of Ultra, the deciphered Enigma coding, the Allies were already aware that an attack was imminent. With the help of the island's civilian population, the Allies fought fiercely to resist the German airborne invasion, and they inflicted heavy losses on the Nazi paratroopers. In fact, by the end of the first day, May 20th, it appeared as if the Allies had the upper hand, 
but the battle was far from over, and due to miscommunication, the Germans managed to take Malem airfield to the west of the island, which meant reinforcements could be flown in, overwhelming Allies. After ten days, the Germans were victorious, and General Wavell had no choice but to authorise the Allied evacuation of Crete, leaving the island under Nazi control. However, although Hitler decided that there would be no more large-scale airborne operations due to the heavy German losses at the outset of the Battle of Crete, the Allies were very impressed and started to look at using paratroopers in the future, building their own airborne divisions. While all eyes were focused on the war in Europe, the tension was also building in the Far East. When war was declared in 1939, the Japanese had already been at war with China since 1937, in the Second Sino-Japanese War, and there were far-reaching consequences. Wherever the Imperial Japanese Army instigated conflict, military personnel and civilians alike faced the most brutal regime. Just months before World War II began, America had imposed sanctions on Japan after their terror bombing of the Chinese city of Chongqing in May 1939, when more than 5,000 civilians were killed in just two days. An embargo was put upon the export of airplane engine parts to Japan from America, and as time went on and the Japanese showed no sign of halting their relentless quest to dominate the Far East, further sanctions were destined to follow. News of an earlier attack by the Japanese on the city of Nanjing where the most appalling atrocities were committed against a civilian population had also reached the West. And as well as imposing sanctions against the Japanese, President Roosevelt had also been providing aid to China. During World War II, Chongqing came under numerous Japanese attacks, and as Germany and Russia prepared for a bitter battle, the Japanese bombed the city yet again. On June 5th, a largely undefended civilian population were targeted as the Air Force of Imperial Japan flew more than 20 sorties over the city, bombing continuously for more than three hours. The actual numbers of casualties were not recorded, but some 4,000 local residents were asphyxiated after a tunnel they were hiding in collapsed, trapping them below ground. For the people of China, as for those of any nation the Japanese conquered, these were truly terrible times, with Japan's policy of the three alls – kill all, burn all, loot all – no quarter was ever given. And for the Americans still poised upon the sidelines of the conflict, the alarm bells over Japan's barbaric behaviour were now ringing loud and clear. But for the time being, the mighty USA had to be content with ever-increasing sanctions and an embargo on trade with Japan. Oil would soon become a major issue, as the Americans were preparing to stop supplying the Japanese, who of course had no natural resources of their own. They desperately needed American oil to keep the cogs of their military machine turning, something President Roosevelt was well aware of. However, backing the Japanese into a corner would have consequences that he could never have imagined. While Japan remained an ominous presence to the east, Roosevelt was also concerned about developments in the European war to the west. The American people had been fiercely opposed to joining the war against Nazi Germany. But while the British continued to struggle through bomb raids and the Blitz, public opinion regarding the war in Europe had started to thaw a little. Daily radio broadcasts gave the Americans the opportunity to follow their progress in extraordinary detail, 
reports were often conducted at street level as Londoners rushed for their bomb shelters, and while British resolve remained as firm as ever, the American people began to foster a deep respect for the beleaguered nation. The Battle of Britain, that had taken place during the summer of 1940, had also proved an inspiration to many Americans, as the bravery of the RAF captured the public imagination. Hundreds of US citizens had started volunteering for service in the RAF, hoping to play their part in the attempt to stop Hitler in his tracks and ensure Nazism did not become a dominant force in the world. Even famous actors signed up to do their part, with James Stewart registering for service with the US Air Force in early 1941 and Clark Gable a year later. Soon support for the British increased to the point where an all-age short of war system was implemented, providing much needed backup for the Allies. Earlier in 1941, Churchill had called on Roosevelt for help, imploring the US President, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. And by March, Congress had passed the Lend-Lease Act. American warships were also sent to escort Allied merchant shipping crossing the Atlantic Ocean, so that much-needed supplies could reach the British mainland, while the Nazi U-boats continued to prowl the seas. Support for the European war was extended even further, when steps were taken to freeze German and Italian finances. As the Nazis had marched through the nations and cities of Europe, they had seized gold from many banks and, more hauntingly, had even confiscated money and possessions from concentration camp victims and other civilians. Much of what they had stolen was now being stored in the US and was a major part of their wartime funding. When all assets held by Germans and Italians within the United States were frozen on June 14th, it dealt a major blow to the Nazis, as tensions on a global scale continued to rise. Nevertheless, while the American president did all he could to help Britain and the Allies, there were many of his countrymen who were strongly against Roosevelt's moves to aid the European war. Public figures like Charles Lindbergh believed that the war with Hitler was a European affair and that the real enemy of the United States was communist Russia. He believed that sending any sizable force to the aid of the British would leave America open to attacks from the Soviet Union, which he was convinced would result in the destruction of Western civilization. But Lindbergh couldn't have been any further wide of the mark, because while Britain braced itself for the invasion Hitler had promised on the heels of the Luftwaffe's aerial bombardment, the Soviet Union was about to become the next victim of Adolf Hitler's master plan for world domination. Despite the non-aggression pact signed between the Soviet Union and Germany in August 39, and their joint invasion of Poland, Hitler always had an Eastern campaign on the agenda. His perception of the Soviet Union was as a nation populated by ethnic Slavs ruled by Jewish Bolshevik masters. Way back in the mid-1920s, Hitler's book Mein Kampf presented his view of world order, and even in these early days of his rise to prominence, he had stated that Germany's destiny was to turn to the East, as it had done 600 years earlier. Consequently, under Hitler's direction, 
the Nazis made it a priority to kill, deport or enslave Russian and other Slavic populations in order to repopulate their homelands with pure-blooded Germanic peoples. However, strong as Hitler's hatred of Jews and Bolsheviks was, there were other driving forces that motivated his persistent desire to conquer nations to the east of Germany as well as to the west. Hitler undoubtedly recognized the enormous wealth of the Soviet Union, a land rich in precious resources, which he was convinced could serve as the equivalent of India to the British for the Third Reich. So, as Stalin continued to build up his Red Army, using the very same materials that Germany were coveting for their war effort, the urgency for an attack on the Eastern Front began to grow. The fact that Stalin had control of materials vital to the Nazi war machine was far from ideal as far as Hitler was concerned. And when the Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov visited Berlin in November 1940, the Führer's disquiet about the Russians' power escalated. With the Soviet Union in such a strong economic position, Hitler realized that he may be forced to bend to any demand Stalin chose to make, and he was determined not to lose a moment in his preparation for an Eastern campaign. Back in December 1940, Hitler had ordered Führer Directive No. 21, and from the opening statement, it was obvious that he meant business. The armed forces of Germany must be prepared, even before the conclusion of the war with England, to defeat Soviet Russia in one rapid campaign. The campaign, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, in honor of the medieval German king and Holy Roman Emperor, even Hitler had to acknowledge that it would be a monumental struggle between two opposing worldviews. For the campaign to be successful, Hitler was aware that timing was everything. This would need to be blitzkrieg tactics at their swiftest, because not only would the Red Army be extremely dangerous once they started retaliating, but also, if Russia hadn't been conquered by the onset of winter, the bitter cold weather would become a major factor. On their home territory, in extreme conditions, the Red Army would definitely have the advantage. German reconnaissance planes were rapidly deployed to survey the vast Soviet territory, in order to gather intelligence, and as the Nazi generals were busy formulating battle plans, Hitler's troops were beginning to build up in Poland. As mentioned earlier, the British Prime Minister had attempted by various means to warn Stalin of the impending attack, but just as Churchill didn't trust Stalin, the Russian leader felt exactly the same way about his British counterpart. Also, of course, Stalin was well aware of Germany's dependence on Russian resources and, as a consequence, did not believe it possible that Hitler would take such a rash course of action. And all the while, he and his generals had agreed upon a strategy for the daring advance. Three separate army groups would attack along what were old historical invasion routes, as the Germans were not the first to have had ambitions to conquer Russia. The Emperor Napoleon had attempted just such an invasion back in 1812, and although he'd reached Moscow, in the end the strength of the Russians, combined with the bitter winter weather, had resulted in a humiliating defeat. Yet Hitler believed he could triumph where Napoleon had failed. The German's Army Group North was assigned to march through the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania and progress into northern Russia with the aim of either taking or destroying the city of Leningrad. Hitler's Army Group Center would be given the task of advancing to Smolensk and then Moscow, 
marching through the region that today is known as Belarus. In the meantime, Army Group South was to strike the heavily populated and agricultural heartland of the Ukraine, taking Kiev before continuing to the east, all the way to the River Volga and the oil-rich region of the Caucasus. And all the while, as May 1941 progressed to its conclusion, it was evident that bombing Great Britain into submission with the Blitz was not working. The German occupation of the island nation was for the time being at least unlikely, and Adolf Hitler looked for alternative ways of bringing Winston Churchill and the people of Great Britain into line. As bizarre as it may now sound, Hitler's plans to attack Russia were finalized with him believing that if Germany demonstrated its might by defeating Stalin's Red Army, the British would be intimidated into capitulating peacefully to any demands the Fuhrer might make. However, in effect, attacking Russia was destined to actually allow Britain some respite as resources were redirected eastwards. Despite Stalin's determined belief that Hitler was not going to attack the Soviet Union, the evidence was far suggesting that the Russian leader was being naive, as his commanders, including the extremely competent Marshal Zhukov, urged him to act, Stalin eventually bowed to their requests for reinforcements and began moving divisions of the Red Army in preparation. Also, towards the end of May, Stalin called up 800,000 reserve forces, but he still persisted in his belief that Hitler would not attack. This was all to the Germans' advantage through the early weeks of June 1941, and even when the German ambassador to Moscow informed the head of Soviet international affairs that Hitler intended to go to war with Russia on June 22nd, Stalin dismissed the report as disinformation. Just days later, Hitler issued further directives, preparing for an attack on the Soviets. The German armaments industry was to focus on the Navy and Air Force in the Mediterranean and Western Asia, where Nazi troops were to continue fighting in Egypt and Turkey, while plans were put in place to capture Gibraltar. Hitler also received good news from North Africa, because as the British launched Operation Battle Axe, attempting to lift the siege of Tobruk, it only lasted three days between 15th and 17th of June and failed miserably. With Hitler's confidence in the ascendancy, a treaty of non-aggression was signed with Turkey, as his final preparations for Operation Barbarossa were maneuvered into place. However, it wasn't only in the European theater of war that the pressure was mounting. Roosevelt, of the American government, had by this time suspended petroleum exports to Japan from East Coast and Gulf ports, an action that would leave the Japanese military machine in a precarious position, with no viable fuel supply to fall back upon. But the consequences of America's sanctions were still months away, and Stalin and the Russians were about to get the shock of their lives. In the early hours of Sunday, June 22nd, just as the Russians had been previously told, Operation Barbarossa began with the bombing of major Soviet cities by the Luftwaffe. Around, some three million German troops went into action, with the element of surprise very definitely on their side. When news of the invasion reached Stalin, he evidently found it very hard to believe what was happening, despite the 90 separate warnings he'd been given of Hitler's intentions since July 1940. In fact, 
when Marshal Tsukov telephoned to speak to Stalin directly, the Russian leader was by all accounts completely silent. Tsukov asked, Did you understand what I said, Comrade Stalin? And when it was evident that he did not, Tsukov had to repeat the information all over again. Consolidating their position, the Luftwaffe also worked extensive reconnaissance, monitoring the Soviet response and having destroyed almost 4,000 Russian aircraft in the first three days, were able to support German troops moving at devastating speed on the ground. The Soviet Defense Minister, Marshal Timoshenko, was swift to call for men, horses and vehicles to be supplied for the war effort, as well as directing what was left of the Soviet Air Force to target German aircraft. It's interesting to note that Winston Churchill responded with an evening radio broadcast on the day of the invasion, offering help to the Russians fighting for their homeland. However, in the days that followed, the American response was perhaps less sympathetic if the thoughts of the future US President Harry S. Truman were anything to go by when he remarked that it was a very good thing for Germany and Russia to be at war and that he sincerely hoped they would finish each other off. As the military implications of Germany's attack on Russia were played out across the wide expanses of the Soviet Union, the political minefield suddenly became just as treacherous. There was no doubt that Hitler had awoken a sleeping giant, although it would be some months before the Germans would fully realize the enormity of the task that they'd been charged with. However, even at the time of the invasion, the German Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop looked to his Japanese allies for assistance, urging them to attack Russia from the north. But Japan was busy formulating a major offensive against the USA and made it clear that they would wait until the Germans had at least captured Moscow and reached the Volga River before joining the battle against the Soviets. Even so, as the weeks of June passed, the Russian Red Army had quite enough to contend with as the German thrust gathered momentum. At this point, the Russians were still in a state of chaos and disarray. When the city of Minsk fell on June 27th, Hitler's tanks were already a third of the way to Moscow. As 1941 reached its halfway point, nobody could have predicted what was going to happen next. Suddenly, for the British, the Russians were no longer fighting alongside the Germans, and the beleaguered Winston Churchill was keen to hold out an olive branch to Joseph Stalin. In peacetime, they would have been on opposing sides of any argument, but throughout history, war has always made for strange alliances, and this was no exception. With Roosevelt's help from the sidelines, Churchill had come a very long way. But without America fighting fully for the Allies, the British Prime Minister would welcome the Russians into the fray, if not with open arms, then with a grudging acceptance of Britain's situation. Churchill was convinced that destroying Hitler and his Nazi regime as quickly as possible was vital, and if an alliance with Russia made this more likely, that was how he would proceed. We know it will be hard. We expect it will be long. We cannot yet see how deliverance will come or when it will come. But nothing is more certain than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers will be sponged and purged and if need be blasted from the surface of the earth. Hitler's objective to intimidate the British into capitulation had ironically served only to strengthen their resolve and their position. With the mighty Russians as allies, and as the Nazi dictator planned his next move, events in the Pacific theatre of war were poised to dominate the remainder of 1941. Before the year was out, Hitler would be at war with the three major world powers, Great Britain, Russia and the USA 
as the Japanese prepared to alter the course of history.